Well, hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for this online message for Deep Rivers Church this weekend. Hope that everything is well with you. Maybe you're out of town uh, visiting or getting out of town cabins or friends or whatever. Uh, either way, hope you're having a good time. If you're not feeling well, hope you bounce back soon and you're able to join us again. For announcements, I have the obnoxious yellow uh, announcement sheet. Wednesday night is prayer house, 7 p.m. Friday morning is the men's Bible study, 6 or 8.30 Saturday morning is the men's breakfast, the second Saturday men's breakfast. We're back at Soda Jerk at 9 a. No, that's 8 a.m. Oh, 8 a.m., 8 a.m., 8 a.m. at Soda Jerk. All right. Um, no, and then Deep Dive, May 20th and the 21st. It's a little bit, It's we're moving it up one week uh, to avoid the Memorial Day weekend. It's on what does it mean to be created in God's image. And then in June 3rd, kickoff breakfast, summer kickoff breakfast. We'll go over the summer calendar. And then uh, June 4th, we start our combined services. All right. I don't know how it happened, but rest has almost become a bad word. Have you ever almost been embarrassed to tell somebody that you didn't do anything productive? Uh, you know, hey, how was your day? What'd you do? And you're kind of, well, you didn't do anything. You just rested. And for some reason, we feel like we got to make excuses for it. Our culture is busy. We go from one thing to the next to the next. And we almost are embarrassed that we might have spent a day doing nothing. Rest is important. This isn't a sermon. Uh, this is not a message on Sabbath. Um, we're going to hit on that real quick. But it's not a message about Sabbath. It's, it's just a message about rest. And um, so we are working our way through the book of Hebrews. And... Um, this weekend, it's Jesus is better than both Joshua and Aaron, uh, not just them as men, but what they stood for, what they represented. So we're in Hebrews 4. Uh, just settle in. I'm just going to read uh, the first 16 verses, and then we'll start unpacking it a little bit. It says this, God's promise of entering his rest still stands. So we ought to tremble with fear that some of you might fall short of experiencing it. For this good news that God has prepared this rest has been announced to us just as it was to them, the ancestors of old, the Hebrew ancestors. But it did them no good because they didn't share the faith of those who listened to God. For only we who believe can enter his rest. As for the others, God said, in my anger, I took an oath. They will never enter my place of rest, even though this rest has been ready since he made the world. We know it is ready because the scriptures mention the seventh day. On the seventh day, God rested from all his work. So God rest is there for people to enter. But those who um, first heard this good news failed to enter because they disobeyed. So God set another time for entering his rest. And that time is today. If Joshua had succeeded in giving them this rest, God would not have spoken about another day of rest still to come. So there is a special rest still waiting for the people of God. For all who have entered into God's rest have rested from their labors just as God did after creating the world. So let us do our best to enter that rest. But if we disobey God as the people of Israel did, we will fail. The word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than a sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between the soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Everything is exposed before his eyes. He is the one to whom we are accountable. Since we have a high priest who has entered heaven, let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest understands our weaknesses, for he faced all the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy, and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. I just kind of, as we often do when we work through a passage, just kind of go through it phrase by phrase and just to kind of unpack it and, and just praying that maybe just one of these uh, phrases will pop out for you and, and be meaningful. 
It starts off with um, God's promise to enter his rest still stands. I want you to stop and ponder that for a little bit. You know, we kind of sometimes just skip over phrases, even if we're familiar with that part of scripture. and We really don't ponder it and, and really uh, let it unpack. Um, but God's promises of entering his rest still stands. Um, what is the passage really saying? What is his rest? It's, it's his rest. It's not our rest. It's his rest. Um, what boss would ever say to an employee, hey, come enter my rest. Come enter into my rest. Because the boss still works. In fact, the, the boss might be more stressed than the employee. So for an employee to enter the rest of his boss, that might not be very settling because the boss's life could still be quite a mess and stressed out. So how do you enter into the rest of somebody who is, um, is busy um, or still at work in that respect? But we enter God's rest, not ours and nobody else's. Now we're going to unpack this in just a, a few moments. Um, the rest still stands. It's still available. Again, this was written to Hebrew Christians. And the writer saying, you haven't missed the bus like your ancestors did. You have a second chance to enter into this rest. Then the text goes on. And this, I found, was really, really, I, again, never really unpacked it. and never spent a lot of time thinking about it. We ought to tremble with fear that some of you might fail to experience it. What are they trembling at? Is it salvation? Or is it a life, or a fear of missing a life of rest? Now, understand, this book is written to Hebrew believers, these folks are already Christians, so make a pretty strong argument. This this isn't the gospel that they are trembling. We tremble about hell. We tremble about people not coming to a saving relationship with God. It seems like the writer of Hebrews is trembling. He's afraid that they're going to miss out on this rest and that they're going to be a people of work and striving to please God. So Again, I think when you look at the text, he's not afraid that they're going to be lost. He's afraid that they're going to miss out on the rest that is available to people who are already saved. This is a pretty sad thing in a lot of respects. Today, I think, unfortunately, God's church is full of people striving and still kind of hoping um, that they've earned God's favor. It's a very, very sad thing. Um, I think this is one of the reasons we have as a phrase for our church, there is more, because we want people to understand what it means to be uh, having been co-crucified with Christ, that your identity, a new identity, and, and that is the key thing to entering into his rest. Again, we're not trembling in fear of not being saved. The writer is trembling in fear that they're going to miss out on the benefits of the life now that is available, a life of rest. The text goes on, they, the desert ancestors, the Hebrew ancestors, they didn't, the ones stuck in the desert, uh, the ones who missed out on God's first attempt to give them rest, they didn't share the faith of those who listen to God. Who has rest? Who has rest? Those who listen to God, those who trust. If you want to be a person who enters into God's rest, you need to be somebody who trusts in him. They didn't listen to God. They were listening to other things, whether it was evil or their own flesh. The key question is whose voice? This is really a key question in the Christian life. Whose voice are you listening to? Because you're going to hear, in quotes, a lot of voices, in quotes. And, and a lot of, we got we got to take some time and go, wait, wait. Is that just my flesh talking? As we talked about the deep dive class, you have an enemy who's out to steal, kill, and destroy. Is it that voice? Is it the voice of our flesh or is it God's voice? And, and um, if we want to be a people of rest, we have to be able to recognize God's voice in this. This leads to those who first heard the good news failed to enter because they did disobey. Again, obedience and rest are tied together. Obedience, and because obedience requires trust. Those three things work together. Obedience, trust, and rest. We want to be a people of rest. We have to be having a life of obedience. And that means trust. Think on that. What, what, what issue do you kind of wrestle with when it comes to obedience? There's a chance that the root of that is a lack of trust in God. 
Last week I had this phrase, it was in the middle of a longer quote, and you might not have recognized the significance of it, but is this, comfort for unbelievers would be their destruction. God giving comfort, God giving rest to unbelievers would just be their destruction because then they would have no need for him. Um, so again, rest is something that we enjoy due to this saving relationship with Christ. But comfort and rest for unbelievers um, would only lead to uh, or enable more of their undoing. The text goes on, if Joshua has succeeded in giving them rest. Now last week the topic was Jesus is better than Moses. This week the title is Jesus is better than Aaron and Joshua, Joshua and Aaron. And you think, how did Joshua fail? You know, it says right here, uh, if Joshua had succeeded in giving them this rest, how did Joshua fail? He led him into the promised land. They made it in. Moses didn't get him in. Joshua got him. How can you say that Joshua failed? How can the text say that Joshua failed? Well, I have a quote. In fact, we have a new, a new element of the message once in a while will show up. It's called this week's Someone Smarter Quote. It's a quote from someone smarter than me. Shockingly easy to find quotes from people that are smarter than me. So let somebody else explain it. The entry into Canaan under Joshua could not have been the ultimate rest promised by the Lord to his people. Otherwise, the prospect of failing to enter it would not have been held out for a later generation of Israel. Hebrews 4, 6 through 8. This final Sabbath rest for God's people in his presence is the promised land was held out for the later Israelites. For the rest is brought by Jesus, the greater Joshua. It is held out to us as well. We'll enjoy it only if we continue clinging to Christ. Again, there's, in some ways, two promised lands. There's the promised land of Canaan. Joshua got him into that promised land, but he didn't get the people into the same rest that Jesus enters us into. And again, Joshua and Jesus, um, Jesus in the Old Testament Hebrew would be Joshua, so they're kind of very similar names. One of them brought the people into Israel, but that was not a permanent rest. Jesus, the, um, the new Joshua, if you will, the greater Joshua, brings us into a lasting rest. The text went on, all who have entered into God's rest have rested from their labors, just as God did after creating the world. Again, whose rest? Um, God's created the world in six days and he rested on the seventh day, not because he was tired, let's be clear. He didn't do it because he was tired. He just did it as an example for us but Jesus's work or labor of the cross, now we see him at rest. He sits on the throne, the first rest of God. We could call the seventh day rest. We could call the Jesus's rest after his work of the cross as a throne rest. And here's the point. We join God in this rest. We join him in that we've been co-crucified with him. So we also get to enjoy the same rest that he has. This rest is the same rest as God's own. It's the rest in which he enjoys. We enjoy God and his work when we enter into his rest. Again, it's his rest. You can go back to the analogy of the boss. You can't enter into your boss's rest because your boss is never going to experience rest. So how can you join him in his? But the work of Jesus, the work of God for our salvation is done. So now we enter into his rest. But then we have this, um, this line that will perplex many. It's sort of one of the bigger points uh, of the message because it's irony. It's, it's a paradox. The text goes on to say, let us do our best to enter that rest. That's the New Living Translation. The NIV says, make every effort to enter into the ESV says, strive to. The King James Version says, labor therefore to enter that rest. What does it mean to make every effort, to strive, to labor? This is what it means. It means to show a diligent opposite of the attitude that characterized 
the Hebrew ancestors. Again, this is written to Hebrew Christians. And, and he was saying, don't do what they did. They were not diligent. Their faith was not a diligent faith. Show a diligence that is opposite of the attitude. Do not follow their example, but diligently believe in Christ. That's the effort to believe in what Christ has done. Now, this word diligent, maybe it's easier to understand it when we hook it up with another word, difficulties, diligent and difficulties. It takes some work to trust and keep faith in hard times. That was true for the Old Testament Hebrews, and it's true for us. A diligent faith and obedience are necessary in order to withstand these such difficulties and enter into God's rest. It's a present tense verb. We who have believed are entering God's rest. Again, the Christian life is a journey and, and not just an event. Your profession of faith sets you on our way towards God's rest, but only genuine faith guarantees entry into it. Your faith has to be genuine. There has to be a testing to it. Trials necessitate that we do our best so that its authenticity is seen. Again, authenticity, truthfulness, genuineness of our faith is only revealed in hard circumstances. This means we have to choose to depend only on God. We need to trust him implicitly and we need to yield to his plan or his sovereign will for your life. So it's not working to enter rest. It's working to trust. Okay, there's a difference there. Yeah, it does take some effort for us to trust. And when we trust, then we enter rest. So we're not working to enter rest, as in if I do this, God will be happy with me. If I go to church, if I tithe, if I go on that mission trip, if I do my devotions every day, that's the work. That's not what gets you rest. That work, if you will, builds your trust. And when you have that trust, then you will enter into God's rest. It's not work to please, to earn God's favor. And then when God is pleased with us, enter the rest. That's not it. The effort it takes for us is, is to trust. That, that does take some effort. I, I think I, my personal belief is that when a Christian dies, all of them, if they've held to the faith, will hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Because sometimes it does take some work uh, to trust and to have faith. That's what it means to do our best to enter into that rest. Not to earn God's faith. So then, not to earn God's um, pleasure, I will, should say. Not to earn God's pleasure, but our work is, is to believe. And that's not always the easiest thing. The word, the text goes on, the word of God is alive and sharp, uh, alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword. When you hear the word, word, the word of truth, the word of God, excuse me, the word of truth, I, I want us to think of truth. Instead of just the word, word, I want you to just think of truth. The truth of God is alive and powerful. Again, this is written to first century Christians. They didn't have Bibles like we did. They had Old Testament writings, obviously, and they had the epistles were maybe circulating and the gospels might have been circulating, but the truth of God is alive and powerful. Yes, it's the word for us, but for them, it was the truth. The truth of God, the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword. God's truth, God's word, it diagnoses our condition and it accurately and supernaturally discerns our spiritual health. When the word of God exposes our weaknesses or unbelief, it, it demonstrates its power and its precision. Submitting ourselves to God's truth allows for the ministry of the word. Again, that's a phrase that maybe we just kind of glance over and not really sit and ponder and let that soak in. It's the ministry of God's word. It's the ministry of God's truth in us. God meets us in his word and the Holy Spirit works powerfully through it. Again, we have one of our core values that God still speaks. 
And if we're not careful, as much as we might pursue the voice of God through the Holy Spirit, we need to remember God's primary way of revealing himself to us is through his word. It's two ways. And the word, the scriptures that we have, that's his primary. That's his first and foremost way of speaking to us. This text, as you know, if you, it goes on, I read it, it, the word of God has the, the ability to uh, um, uh, cut in between soul and spirit. Uh, I'll just put this in as a plug for um, coming up. The next deep dive class is the nature of humanity, and, and we are going to talk a little bit about um, what does it mean that we are soul and spirit. I'm going to turn some things off here. Got a little glitchy. Um just a plug for that on the 20th, I the 21st, we're going to talk about what does it mean that we're creating and, and uh, what does our humanity mean? Is there a difference between soul and spirit? All right. Um, again, the title of this message is Jesus is better than Joshua and Aaron. Uh, we've talked uh, a little bit about Joshua. He failed to enter the people into a permanent rest, even though he lot of, brought them into the land of Canaan. Now it's, it, it's, better than Aaron. Again, the text, we have a high priest who understands. We have a high priest who has entered heaven. Um, for the Greek mind, uh, the mindset of the Greeks, the primary attribute of God was apatheia, which I believe we get the word apathy from. It was the inability to feel anything at all. And they really saw their gods as just not having the same empathy or sympathy for us, but that's not Jesus. That's not Jesus at all. This is the difference. Jesus added humanity to his deity and he lived among us. Um, sometimes you hear of different stories going on. Um, let's say you grew up in a place really far away. Um, like I grew up in Indiana, good distance. And if something were to happen in Indiana, the hometown that I grew up in, Valparaiso, Indiana, if there was uh, something that, you know, a tragic thing happened there, whether it be a storm or an act of violence or something, it might impact me a little bit more because I've been there. I, I spent a lot of time there. I would have more sympathy for the people there because I've been there. And, and Jesus has been with us. And so he, he knows he is the best high priest. His sinlessness was, at least in part, an earned sinlessness as he gained victory after victory in the constant battle with temptation that life in this world entails. So even though he lived amongst us, he was still sinless. Now Aaron was the high priest of the Hebrews. He represented the, the priestly line. Um, our high priest is omnipotent and compassion, Aaron certainly wasn't. So we can come boldly to him. Um, discouraging us from this access is a key strategy for Satan. He wants us to see Jesus as unapproachable. He wants us to see God as unapproachable. And if you think about it, it's a pretty clever scheme on his behalf. On his behalf. That's why we talk a little again about identity and authority because Satan certainly does not want you to know who you are and, and what you can do. But it does mean that we can come um, boldly. Uh, it does not mean that means we come proudly or we come arrogantly or we come with presumption, but it does mean that we can come constantly. We can come without reservation. We can come freely. Without fancy words, we can come with confidence, we can come with persistence, and maybe most importantly, we can come without shame. Again, just to kind of wrap things up, is in this series on Hebrews, Jesus is better than both Joshua and Aaron, not only um, because they were men, but because of what they did and, and what they represent. And again, this is a vitally important thought to get. Joshua failed. You think, again, how did he fail? But I want you to think about this conversation in this context. There's two promised lands. There's the promised land of Canaan and the promised land of fill in the blank. Now, 
it'd be really tempting to think, all right, the promised land in the Old Testament was uh, Canaan. That was the, where the people were going. So you think our promised land must be heaven. And I want to say that's, that's, that's the wrong answer. Sorry. There's two promised lands. In the Old Testament, it was Canaan. For the New Testament, it's not heaven. It's God's rest, that we enjoy God's rest now. That's the abundant life. Yes, when this life is over, we will experience heaven, but salvation is more than just your golden ticket that gets you into God's eternal uh, state when this life is over. The promised land for us is God's rest. Rest is peace with God, the belief that he likes you. When you are saved and seeking him, you have his favor. It's a freedom from groveling. It's a freedom from a bondage-like spirit of worship and service. It's deliverance from the burden of rules and religious observance. It's enjoying the rest that God himself enjoys. So here's a fair but challenging question. How are you doing on the rest scale from one to five? How are you doing on each of these four points? Do you feel like you have peace with God? Do you think God likes you or is he disappointed with you all the time? Um, again, he knows everything and he's already died for everything. I am under the belief, my personal self, that you can't disappoint God because he already knows. So you should experience a peace with God. As a, uh, do you feel a freedom from groveling and bondage like spirit of worship and service? Do you want to do things or do you feel like you have to do things? Deliverance from the burden of rules and religious observance. So think about it. How are you doing um, on that rest scale? And then when it comes to Aaron, again, a human high priest. Think about Aaron. You can imagine what uh, clothes a high priest of Israel would wear, and I'm sure he had fancy clothes. And if you ever saw Aaron walking through the Hebrew settlement or wherever they're at, he would probably be very unapproachable. Um, he would be, have a measure of power for sure, but he would be pretty unapproachable. Conversely, you can find the friendliest pastor or the friendliest pe uh, priest around, but they're still human and not that all powerful. They're limited in what they can do. That's what makes Jesus our perfect high priest. He is approachable, yet all-powerful at the same time. So the last question is, is, you know, how approachable is God to you? Do you find him to be approachable or, or not? And I'll ask that same question. How are you doing on the God is approachable scale? Do you see him as somebody you can come to um, constantly? without reservation, freely, without fancy words, with a confidence, with persistence, and like I said, most importantly, without shame. So Jesus is better than Joshua. He delivered a lasting peace. Jesus is better than Aaron because he is a high priest who is both powerful and approachable. Well, again, thank you so much for joining us. I hope all is well, and we'll see you again real soon. Again, in June 4th, we'll be all together, one service, 10 a.m. on a Sunday morning. I think most people, everybody's, most people, most people, I think everybody, I think everybody's looking forward to it. So hopefully we'll see you if we haven't seen you. We'll see you there. Thanks so much. Take care. God bless. Bye.